We are beginning a brand new series of Shirim in honor of Elul, the month of Elul. This Shiu comes directly from the writings of Rabbi Ben Sion Meir Chai Uziah. Harav Uziah, those of you who've learned with me long enough, you know who he is. He was the first Sephardic chief rabbi of the state of Israel. He was also the chief rabbi of Israel before the state of Israel, alongside his companion and friend, Harav Avraham Yitzchak HaKohen Kuk. Harav Shalom. Harav Kuk's Askara was earlier this week. And Harav Uziel's Askara is later this month. The book that we're about to study from, and if you want to see pictures of Harav Uziel, I brought a book of pictures. Tell me I left it in the car or I left it at home. That's okay. So we don't have pictures. That is so strange. The situation of Rav Uziel's writings. Rav Uziel passed away in 1953. And since 1953, there was a decline in people who studied the writings of Rav Uziel. Why? I can't tell you. I have theories. In recent years, there's been an uptick in the studying of the writings of Rav Uziel, something that is obviously I bless very much over. The book that we're about to study, called Hegione Uziel, are some of the most important volumes that Rav Uziel wrote. If his books were reprinted in a beautiful hardcover edition that is no longer in print, by the way, so these editions are out of print already. Uh, Hegione Uziel was reprinted as a Sephardic photocopy with binding that is uh, poorer than the people who published the book. And uh, it's impossible to find. Impossible, impossible. I was very, very happy to discover that Sepharia recently uploaded the writings of Rav Uziel, at least this volume of Higyone Uziel. So if you wanted to find the text that we're going to study tonight, you can find it. Aside from on the website of Rav Uziel's foundation, you can also find it on sepharia.org. The source sheet that we will be using in particular was sent out by WhatsApp and Google Classroom. I once thought of giving a shiu on the writings of Rav Uziel regularly, especially this book, Hegyone Uziel. But I figured if I gave 77 introductions to Agarita, then we would never study the book, Hegyone Uziel, because I'd be given introductions my whole life. Rav Uziel is an incredible teacher. The way that he explains things, the clarity that he has. He writes like a prophet. That's his style. You would ask me, what is Abu Ziel's style? Navi. He writes like a prophet. Harav Kuk, and I mean no disrespect to Harav Kuk, has a similar poetic style. But in my opinion, the writings of Abu Ziel, if the world would only pay attention to and study them, would be in a completely different place. And so tonight, I wanted to talk to you about post Teshuva. The last few years, we've used the month of Elul to discuss Teshuvah, how to do Teshuvah, why should we do Teshuvah, what does it mean to do Teshuvah. Last year, we even spent some time in the writings of Rabbi Chaim David Halavi on the mechanism of how, to, how Teshuvah works. How could it be you do something wrong, and then with words, you fix it? If I crashed your car, and then I said, I'm sorry, does it fix your car? If someone kills someone else, and says, I'm sorry, does it help? So then, how could it be that we commit all the crimes in the world and somehow with our words, how could it be that as I admit my wrongdoing and I stop doing it, that it's erased from me? Teshuvah, how does it work? And last year we spent some time discussing the writings of Rabbi Yosef Albo, who wrote the book. Sefer HaIkarim. Sefer HaIkarim is an important work of Jewish faith. Rabbi Yosef Albo there uses an idea based on Aristotle somehow. It's not for tonight's you. I figured we always talk about Teshuvah, Teshuvah, Teshuvah. We never talk about post-Teshuvah. So what are we supposed to do after you do Teshuvah? And so after Harav Uziel dedicates a few chapters to the writings on Teshuvah in his book Hegyone Uziel, 
he decides to talk about the next step. The step after Teshuvah, and that's what we're going to study tonight. So if you'll open up your PDF, Pathways of Divine Service. Hegyune Uziel Sha'ar Lamed, chapter 30, section 30. Drachim Ba'avodat Hashem, the ways of serving God. Perik Aleph, chapter 1. Derech Hachayim, the pathway of life. I once taught a shiul here in the writings of Uziel on the Jewish vision for the Mashiach. Now I would ask, do you remember? But some of you weren't here, and the rest of you who were here were sleeping. The room was full. My wife was laughing at me the whole entire shiul. Because that shiul, I thought, was one of the most important shiul we might ever taught at Kehillah Jashamayim. And nobody heard it. I mean, nobody, mashiul chalom yamamash. Nobody heard it. Yeah, and sometimes I recognize that maybe HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want certain things to be taught. He doesn't want his secrets being shared. Tonight I hope you'll stay awake because I left the air conditioning. Hashem. If not, then it's just because I'm not a good teacher. HaChet VeHaPesha Chet and Pesha It's interesting to me that people still name their daughters Pesha. You know that's a name? Yeah. By Nashkenazim, there's a name Pesha. They say Pesha, yeah? and there's Pesha. Pesha. I said if I had twins, I would name them Pesha and Resha. That would be the... <laughs> what kind of name is Pesha? So I don't mean to offend anybody. If you're listening to this, your name is Pesha. You could come to us for a name change. Hachet Pesha, Sin and wrongdoing. Hem netia midachei hachayim odech Hashem. Are a deviation from the way of life or the path of God. Anytime you do something wrong, it goes against what you're supposed to be doing in this world. Who was it, the American president, who said he doesn't want to divert from the war effort? I don't want to mention his name. He doesn't deserve his name to be mentioned. But how could it be? He needs to get involved in Auschwitz. He cannot divert from the war effort. Your life is in a war. And Averot that you do, wrongdoings that we do, are diversions from what we're supposed to be doing in this world. Teshuvah is the return to this path. So if we did something wrong, that was a mistake. When we do something right, that's the right thing. We do Teshuvah, we're straightening out our mistakes. What is the way of Hashem that the Torah made for people? What's the point of life? What are you supposed to be doing? Let's see. Okay. Kabbalists in the room tell me there are four types of creations. Don't go racist on me. Just go. Okay. Chai. No, let's start. Domem. Domem is an inanimate object. Give me an example of domem. Rocks. Yeah, rocks, stones, pebbles. That's domain. Chai. Tzomeach, uh, thank you. Tzomeach. Trees, plants, flowers, cactus. Tzomeach. Chai. Animals. Birds, frogs, cats, dogs, bunny rabbits. And then, midaber, those that speak. There are four categories in the world of creations. I once told you a story, only those of you who know Hebrew will really appreciate it. And the guy once got in a taxi. And the Rosh Hashiva was the taxi driver, and the taxi driver is talking nonsense, absolute nonsense. And he, the Rosh Hashiva, all he has is his mouth is wide open. And he says, uh, Wow, what are you looking at me like that for? It's the first time in my life I ever saw Domem Tzomei Achaim in the Baal. So uh, I'll explain later, it's okay. It only sounds good in Hebrew. That's right. But it was a big chai. It was a big chai. It was in the middle, the middle of the tzmicha. Uh, so, <laughs> you have a person, a human being. What is the difference between a human being and any other creature? Is the fact that he has a bechirato, will, free will. And a human destiny. 
See, there are cows in the world. Cows have a purpose in the world. Human beings have more than a purpose. There's a destiny. There's a reason why a human being is here. Kol adam shehu meshulal hakarazo eno nikra adam chai ela baal chai. A person or any creature that is unaware of their destiny is not actually considered a human being in Judaism thought, but rather just a living being. There are many living beings that have no clue why they're here. And a person can be a living being their whole life if they are completely unaware of why am I here? What is my purpose here? Rabbeinu Moshe Chaim Lutzato, in the beginning of Misrat Yisharim, he tells us, Yesod HaChasidut V'shoresh HaAvodah HaTemima Shidbarer V'yitamet Etzen HaAdam Ma Chovato Be'olam When it becomes clear to a person what is his purpose in this world Anhel, do you mind putting the air conditioning off, please? What is his purpose in this world? By the way, Yesod HaChasidut V'shoresh HaAvodah is the acronym of a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name Yud Kei Vav Thank you and the singer of Israel, who's the singer of Israel? David HaMelech writes in his Tehillim, Adam bikar v'lo yavin, nimshal kabehemot nidmu. What does it mean? Adam bikar v'lo yavin? Someone here say Tehillim? A person doesn't really understand honor. Nimshal ki behemot nidmu. It's like an animal, similar to an animal, a beast. Adam shuchai, a person who is alive. Ve'oved lehanato habsarit v'kiyumo b'chayim. And the whole reason they're alive is to survive and to give their body some good feelings in this world. Ve'no yodea et erech ikrat ha'chayim. He doesn't know how to value the preciousness of life. In America, we say, I want to go kill some time. You've heard that expression? Let's go kill some time. You know who doesn't say they want to go kill some time? People in the hospital. They never say, let's go kill some time. They recognize just how important my time is. But there can even be people who recognize that life is important. They have no clue what they're doing here. They know there's something. I don't know what I'm here to do. <laughs> A person who lives just to feed themselves, to wear nice clothes, to go on vacation, to buy nice things, that person is like an animal. Animals also. They go eat nice grass. Some eat nice worms. Other ones roll over in nice mud because they want to look nice. Other of them, uh, you know, they put straw on their back. Every animal does something else. But that's what an animal does. Mimuvan Zen, that's exactly why our rabbis, Amur Abutainu Zichonam Nevacha, it's why our rabbi said, Rishaim, the evil people, Bechayehem, while they're alive, Kiruim Metim, are called dead people. The Prophet says, I don't want dead people to die. What do dead people do? Do dead people die? Can someone dead die? So what does it mean that Hashem doesn't want dead people to die? He doesn't want Rishayim to die. Ki b'shuvo midarko harav achai. He should come back from his bad way and he should live. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. So when we don't do things the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, our life is not really life. Our life is like a rasha. A rasha? He's really dead. Chaye ha'adam ha'shanem. Ha'reuyim nishman. The life of a person, someone who deserves life. He's a person who uses their mind, their body, their power, their intellect to discover their real purpose, the higher reason for why I'm here. And what do I do with my talents and my understanding and my perception of the world? I do good with them. To who? To all the environment that is around us. And every person. 
So when a person uses their mind to do what? Not just to discover, I know why I'm here, let me go meditate on a mountain for the rest of my life. That's great. You're just as selfish as you were before you discovered why you were here. You discover why you're here only to help everybody else in the world. That's why you're just, with, with what? Everybody's different, he says. Sometimes it's with your intellect. Sometimes it's with your body. Sometimes it's with your money. Sometimes it's with your talents. Look, I don't have a lot of money. So I try the best I can to teach people Torah. That's what I have. That's what I can give. Some people have a lot of money. So what do they do? They use their money to help the world. Some people have a lot of strength. So what do they do? They do mitzvah. They help people. They move things. They pick things. They, they build things. They do. Everyone has the ability to use their talents in a way that is beneficial to the world. That's what's called the path of Hashem. Which guides a person on the way of righteousness and justice. That every action, every step you take, every word you say should be done in righteousness. What does it mean to do something but tzedek? Your actions should be mutzdakim. They should be justifiable. Why did you do that? Why did you say that? In my house, sometimes I ask my kids, why did you do that? And the answer they always say, I don't know. What do I say? You don't have to agree with my parenting method. My wife doesn't. That's a stupid answer. There should never be a time in your life someone says, why did you do something? I don't know. Everything that you do should have intent to it. Even if you punch your brother or your sister, but I did it because they were made me mad. Okay, at least I understand. I don't know. I don't know. It's not an answer. You have to have kavana. Sometimes you see these celebrities. They, they do something terribly racist or they do something evil. They break up. They go, I'm sorry. I didn't know what I was doing. when I, I didn't know what you were doing. He doesn't know what he's doing. A chamo doesn't know what he's doing. A donkey doesn't know what he's doing. You, you're a person. And if you do things that you don't know what you're doing, then I should be very afraid of you. How can I know that one day you're not going to know what you're doing and then I'm, I'm the next victim of your attacks? Everything should be mutzdak. How? Shiu mutzdakim unchoni mitzad atzmam. All of your actions should be good on their own. They should be positive actions. You know, sometimes you do the right thing. What is it? The truth? What about the truth? The truth that's your free? Okay, that's a good one. What does they tell you about truth? Oh, you don't like it? The truth? The truth hurts. Oh, but yeah, I like that one. The truth hurts. Well, maybe your truth is bad. Maybe it's the truth, but it's bad. HaKadosh Baruch commands us not just to do what is right, but also what is good. I spoke about this recently in the class. They made a clip out of it, a good one. I found out there are two kinds of clips. The hater clips and the lover clips, two different clips. So, in the good clips, so what happens when you find a woman in Walmart who's stealing baby formula for her children. So the law says, lock her up, take her kids to foster care. Tzedek says, well, she clearly doesn't have food. She's doing, committing a crime. It's something wrong that she's doing. She can't do it. Take away her kids from her, send them to foster You think the world's going to be better like that? So there has to be a balance of, it has to be good. So it's not just enough that it's right. What you do is right. That's what I have to do. That's what's right. No. It also has to be right in the way that it affects other people's lives. You're going to do slichot. It's one o'clock in the morning. Now you decide, an hour, but I said, we have a minhag. No, we don't have this minhag. But they have, Svaradim have a minhag. That every time they say the 13 attributes of faith, what do they do? Uh, attributes of Hashem, what do they say? They blow the shofar. You ever heard that? So every time, when they say Hashem, Hashem, they blow. That's one o'clock in the morning. All your neighbors are sleeping. You're in an apartment building. Now you blow the shofar once, bad enough. 17 times? At one o'clock in the morning? Yeah, you did what's right. That's a minhag. You're right. That's right. You're also going to go to hell for that minhag. Because what you did is right, but it's not correct. It's not what is righteous to other people. 
You have to know how to do both. People, very, people think, I'm always going to, as long as I do what's right, it doesn't matter. It's not true. I know any of you think so. It's not true. Well, I just said the truth. <laughs> just said the truth. That's not always the way you're supposed to say the truth. You can say the truth without just saying the truth. And if you don't know how, so go to Tamikham and take classes on how to say the truth without just saying the truth. Vizohi derecha kvusha. And this is what our father of the Jewish people said. Because I knew Our great forefather said that I know that my children, my grandchildren, they will fulfill the way of Hashem. How? With righteousness and goodness. Tzedek umishpat. Righteousness and justice is the ruling, measuring stick of everything you do in your life. And that's how you actually have human life. Remember we said before, there's living life. There's a Baal Chai, there's Adam Chai. To be a human being is not just to be living it's to be living, to understand why you're living, to live a life of tzedek, to live a life of mishpat, to live a life that is doing good for other people. That's why you're here. Chaim shen behem tzedek velo mishpat. Life that does not have righteousness or justice in it. Enam re'uyim nishmam. Don't deserve the name life. Ki ma yishayr lanu mechaim ele. Because what will be left from a life that is not righteous, a life that is not just? Just embarrassment and shame. Kaas umachovim. Pain and anger. Achzava umapach nefesh. Disappointment. How disappointing is life when it has no greater purpose? V'chaim sheesh behem tzedek umishpat emet. And a life of righteousness, of tzedek. Osim otanu anshei tzedek v'shoftei emet. Make us righteous people and judges of truth. It gives us a reason to live and a pleasant life while we're living it. You heard of uh, the book Tomer Devorah? My wife didn't write it, but it's a very important book. Tomer Devorah was written by Rabbi Moshe Kordovero. Rabbi Moshe Kodoro? I? I wanted to teach you once. That's right. I did want to teach a um, Mac once. Oh, I didn't know that. He was also the teacher of Maran, Rabbi Yosef Karo, in Kabbalah. Yeah. He writes the following Tsarich Adam. A person must reach a place. Sheshum siba shebaulam, that no reason in the world, lo timnaehu milhetiv, shouldn't stop him back from doing good for other people. Veshum avon umase bene adam bilti hagun, and there should be no wrongdoing or action that someone did to you that should stop you. There should never be something that someone did to you that stops you from helping them. Ever. Ever. How long? At any moment, in any given time. Somebody who hurt you and needs your help today? Once upon a time, I got a phone call from one of the famous people who hurt me in my life. And uh, my wife, my wife saw the call. I'm not answering that phone call. My wife said, Yonatan, if they're calling you, it's probably because there's nobody else in this globe that they can call. So likely you should answer the phone. And I did. Only because of her. Because she read the Ramak, and the Ramak said that there's no reason in the world, nothing someone should do to you, that makes you not want to help them. And just like HaKadosh Baruch Hu, He gives life to the Re'emim, you know what Re'emim are? I don't know what Re'emim are, what are Re'emim? What? It's a 
A big animal. How big? What is a rim? Didn't David have melech once? It was as big as a to be the oryx, according to Okay. David remember, was once standing on the back of a game. He thought he was on top of a mountain. And then it moved. I don't know what is a game, but I trust Rabbi Slifkin if he says it's an oryx. HaKadosh Bechut takes care of even the biggest of animals. Vad betekinim, even the, the eggs of the lice. They're tiny. Takes care of them. And a person doesn't disgrace or embarrass any other creature. Because if a Kadosh Baruch Hu, we're going to start embarrassing things because they're not good enough. So tell me which creature in the world would be good enough not to be embarrassed by a Kadosh Baruch Hu? There's nothing. There's nothing in the world that is good enough for a Kadosh Baruch Hu. And if he would treat every creature, every flower, every rat in the New York subway, every member of your local Ben if he would teach them, treat them like the, the pchutim that they are, then nobody would survive this. Rather, what does HaKadosh Baruch Hu do? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he watches over them, and he takes care of every one of them. Kach tzarich. And a person has to make sure to do good for everybody and not to embarrass anybody. Even the lowest of all the low creatures in the world. You should treat them very importantly. You should pay attention to them. And you should do good for anyone who needs you. Any creature. Any creation. It doesn't say they're Jews. It doesn't say they're tzaddikim. It doesn't say they're human beings. Everybody. Everybody. Where do you learn from? From HaKadosh Baruch I told you once I was speaking with a Christian. I asked, what is my God so special? My God is so special? My God, this morning, the Pope woke up in Rome and HaKadosh Baruch gave him life. And he gave him health. And he gave him food to eat. He gave him water to drink. Fancy clothes. A Pope mobile, he doesn't drive. My HaKadosh Baruch is so big that even the people in the world that spend their whole career denying his truth, he still takes care of them. So what's our excuse? Haravuzi says, what's the purpose of life if life is all about us? If all we do is for ourselves. What's the purpose of Teshuvah? If all Teshuvah is to make my life better? How many more selfish Teshuvahs can you hear about? You want me to find me the Jewish text that says, be yourself? You want to find it for me? Tov. So what does he tell us, Rav Uziel? Zohi achat ha-she'elot, she'adam omed ladin aleha. This is one of the questions that we are going to be asked when we pass away. There are six questions we're going to be asked. The first of them, very good. Sudma Masechet Shabbat has a few. Machnisim adam ladin, sho'alim otov v'omrim, they ask you, nasata v'natata be'emunah. Were you honest in your dealings in the world? Masa or Matan usually is translated business. Avuziel is taking it as a broader understanding. Were you honest in the world? When you worked with people, when you saw people, when you acted with people, were you good? Bemuna. Were you faithful? Were you loyal? Bilchushcha. With your possessions. Bekochacha. With your strength. Uvaskalatcha. With your intelligence. Did you do good with everything that you have? The Caliph Rebbe should live and be well. He once came to Baltimore. So I took a group of guys to go visit him. 
And one of the yeshiva guys that uh, I took to visit the Kalev Rebbe, I'll tell you, he didn't become a chassid afterwards. The Kalev Rebbe looked at him, you know, the Kalev Rebbe was a very, still, still a very intense person. Doesn't mince words. He says things the way he thought. He didn't care what you felt. The Kalev Rebbe grabbed this guy by the face and he said like this, you bal gaiva. You arrogant person. 14, 15 years old. Yeah, we're 11th grade. What's 11th grade? 16? He said, the whole time, every word he said. You think you're so smart? What, because it's easy for you to learn? So you walk around thinking you're the top of the world? You look down on all the other people in your class because you're smarter than them? He said, your intelligence is worth nothing if you don't help the people around you. And this guy was like, you know, a deer caught in the headlights? His whole life, his mom says, you're the best, you're the best, you're God's gift to humanity. You're God's and then he comes to this rabbi, the rabbi says, hey, you're God's gift to humanity? No, not unless you use your talents to help other people. Who needs you to be smart? All of the professors in the universities in the world. All of that incredible wisdom. All of that to do what? Who do you share it with? Who do you give it to? Maybe, by the way, at the rate the university is going, they should keep the wisdom to themselves. <laughs> Maybe the world would be better off sometimes. But a person, they want to learn Torah all day long. Okay, when do you teach Torah? Chacham <laughs> Yosef, just to push people. You sit in kola the whole day. When do you give Maser? So which Maser? I don't have any money. Maser, where's the class that you give every night? You learn the whole day on other people's accounts. When do you give back to the community? This pushed young people to go give Torah classes everywhere. And to come tell us, I teach a class there, I teach a class here, I teach a class. What's the point of learning all this Torah if you're not going to do anything with it? Just for yourself? We don't need selfish people. Every time we stray away from that which is righteous, from the proper path, it's a sin. So when we do things right, we leave the path of destruction and we come to the path of life. To the good way of Hashem. What does Hashem want? What does Hashem want? HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to have a good life in this world and in the next world. Where is that from? Wait, you'll tell me later. It's like a person who's traveling in the desert. You know what happens to them in the desert? They're lost. They're lost. And they don't know where they're going. And they're walking for miles in this direction and miles in that direction. And they're enjoying their time. You know why they're enjoying their time? Because they're free. And they have no baggage. And they don't have to be anywhere. And work can't find them. And their mother-in-law doesn't know where they went. And they're, and they're so happy. Says Abu Ziyan, Hadam Yechashov. Shezohi Dech HaChofesh The guy walking in the desert alone he thinks, I'm living the free life. I'm living off the grid. It's great, this life over here in the middle of the desert. He's free from the government. Even the government is not going to go to the desert to look for you. Even the IRS is not going to look for you in the middle of the desert. <laughs> Tell me, Ovanya, how come the child support ends up finding all the people who need the money, but they never find the people who... How does it work? But this guy in the desert, he's actually on the worst path possible. He's walking in the desert. He has no food. He has no water. There are snakes. There are scorpions. There's a sun. It gets hot. You know what else happens in the desert? It gets cold. The desert at night gets very cold. And it gets windy. And there's no trees to hide inside of. And there's no bushes to go into. And there's a lot of sand. 
and maybe the nearest civilization is 300 miles away. That story about the guy who got lost in the desert. And he's finally making up the last sand dune, hoping that in the next sand dune, he's going to see some civilization. And he's climbing up the hill, climbing up the, climbing up the hill, and he sees a guy, he's selling bow ties. He says, bow ties, $10. And the guy says, please, do you have some water? He says, no, I don't have water, but I sell bow ties for $10. Says, I don't need a bow tie. I need water. Where's the nearest water? And he sees down the valley and back up the sand dune, there's a big sign. It's a restaurant. He says, forget you and your bow ties. And he starts sliding down the sand dune. And he's sliding down, finally makes it to the valley. He looks up, but he sees the restaurant. He sees that sign. It's neon pink. Diner. And he decides he's going to climb up that hill. And he climbs up, climbs up, finally makes it to the doorstep of the restaurant. He opens the door. And the guy there says, um, uh, sorry, but we don't serve people who don't wear bow ties. Go back to my brother and buy yourself a bow tie. Yeah. Sometimes in life, sometimes in life you think you have everything, but you have nothing. Because you need a bow tie to get into the restaurant. And his brother is selling it once and doing over. A guy lost in the desert is almost dead. But he thinks he's free. That's the whole world. People think they're free, says Rav Uziel, but they're lost. They're not free. Just because you don't know where you're going and you don't know where you come from and you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, it doesn't mean you're free. It just means you're lost. Do you know how many people in the world are lost? I walked to a store today. I talked to a guy. Aside from the fact that he was high as a kite. This is a guy, I'm sure if you push him to ask him his name, you probably wouldn't know. He was so lost. He doesn't know who he is. He works in the store. He doesn't know anything. Everything I asked him, there was like a few seconds delay. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't because like you know he has cognitive problems it was a few second delay and I was like oh I was like no you can't I'm asking you for help where's the thing you got... <laughs> now you know why it took me long to check out right this is the... but the poor guy he thinks he's living this dream but he's lost he's lost he's 37 years old working in a little dinky store and wasting all of his money on drugs miskin miskin but I'm sure if you sign, look in the dictionary, what does it mean to be free in America in 2023? What do you see? Look at people in America. Maybe they're Jewish, they're religious, they wear a kippah, their kids go to school, they're married, they have families, they have a job, they've been doing a job for a while, they've been sticking to the same job. You look at them, wow, your life is so limited. You guys are so uh, stuck in a box. You can't eat anything. You oh, that Sabbath. You always you always have to keep it. Every weekend you have to keep it. They look at you like you're stuck, like you're you're held back somewhere. But maybe the opposite is true. Maybe you're the free person because you know where you come from. You know where you're going. You know what you're supposed to do. You might not always do it, but you know what you're supposed to do. The guy who thinks he's free is actually lost. What is it? Very good. And they go down to destruction. They think they're running to a good place, but they don't even know. And only when a person returns back to life, to responsibility of life, to other people, you're saved from death. You know what else is like death? Pizu hanefesh. What is pizu hanefesh? Pizu hanefesh? Not, Say? Not quietly. Oh, it's the opposite would be minuchat hanefesh, the tranquility of the soul. Pizu hanefesh is that your soul is scattered. It's trying to be in a thousand places at one time. You know when you see it? Sometimes it's Shabbat. And a person comes to the Bera Knesset. And you're sitting here. As Yashir Moshe Uvne Yisrael. And everyone's got there sitting around. They have their Sidu and they're singing. There's one person there sitting there like this. And you think he's thinking about work. They're thinking about the mortgage. They're thinking about their kid who has to go to school. They're thinking about their thinking and they're thinking and they're thinking and they're thinking. And they're not wrong on any of the things they're thinking. But they're not here. They're, they're here, but they're not here. They have pizu hanefesh. And you come over and say, Shabbat Shalom. And they jump out of their chair because like, they were a totally different dimension. And where, where did you come from? I was right here. I just can't say, but they didn't even recognize that you were here. 
It's not a bad person. It's a person who's, they're, they're, they're not present anywhere. So why am I alive if I'm not present? You should know our, our menuchat and nefesh. I once was at a parents at a wedding in Yerushalayim. In a hotel, uh, not a hotel, it's a, a wedding hall called Shar, Shar Ha'ir, is that what it's called? Right at the entrance of Yerushalayim. And our parents didn't like the music was so loud, so I went to stand outside with him. And we were talking, and he was watching the street in Yerushalayim. You know the streets like in Yerushalayim? The wedding on a Thursday night, and the whole night, back and forth, back and forth, people back and forth. And a lot of religious people, it's Yerushalayim, back and forth, back and forth, back and our parents was like this. I said, what's going on? He said, the one character trait you need in your life, menuchat nefesh. Stop running everywhere. Stop running. You don't have to go. Stop. Have your schedule. Have your order. The need to go here, to go there, and shop here. But the whole, your whole life, you can't stop. You can't bear being in the same room as yourself. So you drown yourself out with all the distractions of the world. But you're really suffering from pizuh nefesh. Your soul is scattered. To do teshuvah from that, it sometimes means, yeah, coming back to reality and dealing with the burden that is life. But that burden of life, you know, among the poskim, there was an old argument. At what age should a person get married? What does Shulchan Aruch say? 13 is a mitzvah. 18. 18 is a chovah. Obligation. 20 we beat them in the Bedin until they get married. I got married at 23, so my wife, I would be limping to the chupa if that would be the situation. Rama writes over there, we don't have this minhag now, meaning we don't have the minhag to beat them. But still, I mean, maybe your mother will beat you until you do it. But we don't have minhag to beat people. <laughs> the idea, I wasn't talking about you, Ima. But the idea was that a person should get married. And the question is, well, what if I want to study Torah? And I know that once I get married, I have to worry about the bills, I have to worry about my wife, I have to worry about kids that are going to come, I have to all the things in life. You know, you're sitting in yeshiva, your parents are paying your bills, you're living in some dorm, you go eat the food, your biggest suffering is, oh my gosh, they're serving peas and green beans again, i got to go to get a shawarma. Like, that's your biggest struggle in life. And where are you buying a shawarma? With, with your parents' credit card. And I, everything is, life is free. It's Gan Eden. So should you get married? And then try to study Torah. Do you study Torah a little bit, and then you get married. Among the Chachmas, the Faradim, the attitude was, until you get married, and you're struggling with life, you're paying those bills, you're raising those kids, you're dealing with a spouse that doesn't always get along with you, until you do that, all the Torah you're learning is fake. You're living in La La Land. The real Torah happens when you connect yourself into reality, and you try to be a person in reality. It's really easy to theoretically be a person. Think about it. I mean, once had a situation, I'm going to insult some people in the Beda Knesset. We once had a situation here in the Beda Knesset. Somebody donated, it was like the size of the refrigerator, a warmer to the Beda Knesset. A warmer. And uh, they wanted it in the Beda Knesset for the holidays, so we brought it in a truck over here to the bottom of the stairs. This is, this is before, Anhas, before you came here. Okay. Here in the Beda Knesset, all I had were uh, engineers, lawyers, a software designer, uh, you know, programmer. That's what I had. And everybody volunteered because it was very exciting. We're getting a new piece of uh, furniture, equipment in the Beda Knesset. Mamash, everybody came. And you should see, you should see all the masters and PhDs and de- you should see them picking up this thing and they're sh- this way and that way and then how do you make the turn in the stairs? And finally, finally we can't get it through the, the curve of the thing because it's too wide. And they're trying, and they're trying, and they're trying, and they're trying. My brother in Nasruli, he came from New York. Nasruli, I'll tell you what his degree. His degree is, he's a professional bus driver. Okay, that's his degree. He's a happy guy. He loves driving people from New York to Niagara Falls to Philadelphia. To... He doesn't have a PhD in engineering. Nasruli would agree. Yeah, he cannot build a London Bridge. Again, not his... Uh... Nasruli came with his son Ari. They watched us, and they just laughed. And said, can we try now? And just like that. They picked up the thing, they brought it up the stairs, and they brought it to the bed and said, ah, what about the fact that you couldn't make the turn? Genius. Let's just take off the doors. They just took off the two doors, and they picked up the stairs. Sometimes in your life, you could be the most intelligent person in the world, but push comes to shove, are you able to carry the thing up the stairs? You can't carry the thing up the stairs. <laughs> Very good. Baruch remembers that part. Then they couldn't get in the front door. So what do we have? I have a student. He should live and be well. 
he, he studies theoretical mathematics. He's a researcher of theoretical, theoretical mathematics. And I said, what is this uh, research good for? He said, now it's good for nothing. Maybe in 100 years somebody will read it and, and some invention will come out of it. Okay, but sometimes life requires you to be involved in the world and that's freedom. And that's exactly what HaKadosh Baruch told Yechezkel the Prophet when he said, Return back from your evil ways. Why do you want to die, Jewish people? Meaning, being on a bad path, a person might as well be dead. What's the purpose of life if my life has no purpose? This is something we don't talk enough about. We're afraid to talk about it. We don't want to come off as judgmental. I'm not telling you you have to judge other people, but yourself. Who's going to judge you if not you? Who's going to tell you what the right thing to do is if not you? Most of your friends don't care enough about you to tell you the things you need to hear. I had a friend in Yeshiva. He's still my friend. He did something once that I, I thought was really incorrect. It wasn't a good thing. It wasn't good. But I was afraid that if I go tell him, he's never going to talk to me again. It's why most of our friends didn't say anything. What do I care? He wants to ruin his life. He ruins his life. It's not my problem. So one night I went to this friend. I said, I really want to talk to you. And the choice said, I want to tell you something. And I know that by telling you this, you may never speak to me again. But I did the calculation. And I care enough about you that even if you never talk to me again, it would be worth it for me to tell you this. Because I care more about you than I care about you being my friend. And I told that to them. And all of the teachings of Chachamim came true. A person can recognize when words come from the heart. A person who's really a good person can take critique. There's some people who they can't. You tell, you tell them anything, they get offended from you. Nothing you can do about it. There's a certain, it's a personality that every maybe it's because they're very hard on themselves. So judge them favorably. It could be they're already so hard on themselves that when you tell them something wrong, they, they just they can't they, they can't survive that. I, I have a problem. I came from the other place. So I came from a Lithuanian yeshiva when I was a high school student. So over there, all they tell you is that you're wrong. <laughs> there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing positive. You never do anything, but it's not the opposite of a Hasidic yeshiva. And then I went to a Sephardic yeshiva. And the problem with the Sephardic yeshiva? Over there, with the problem with the Sephardic yeshiva? They like to tell you truth that hurts. That's the whole philosophy. They're going to tell you things exactly the way you, you, they want you to hear them. There's no sugar coating it. I'm talking about the old school chachamim. They don't care how you feel. But even if you're not a man, they would still tell you things the same way. You understand? Oh, but yeah, you're in California. It's 2023. You got to be careful. Yes. So, uh, what? But their job, their job is to educate you. That's their job. But sometimes you tell it, you give a person Musa and you see they can't handle it. So don't give them Musa. It's not worth it. But this friend of mine was an honest person, a good person. They heard it. They were upset that they got caught. That was what upset them. But a few days later, they came over and said, I stopped doing what you told me about. And I cannot thank you enough. Most of our friends don't care enough about us. They let us die. They mean, they let us live. They help us do all the bad things we want to do. But those aren't real friends. The real friends are those that say, Shuvu, shuvu harayim. Do teshuvah from the things you do wrong. Lama tamutu bet Yisrael. says, why do you want to die? You want to live a life that's dead? You want to live a life that is alive? Next week, Bezat Hashem, Harav Uziel told us today all about the way of life. So the definition of life is to be a constructive member of society. When you leave this world after 120 years, I don't care what you do for a living, when you leave this world after 120 years, people should be able to recognize what were your contributions to society. I'm not talking about little things, real things. What did you do? Was the world different because you were in it? Some people, they look for a profession. They're trying to figure out a career path. I know someone. They could be a pilot. They could be a soldier. They could be an accountant. They could be a lawyer. They could be, a, they could be everything. Superman. They could be all kinds of things. And when you sit, well, what do you want to be? It has to be the thing that if nobody else would do it, then you would be missing from the world. 
I really, my plan once upon a time was to be a lawyer. That was the plan. I promised my parents, either a lawyer or to be a psychologist. Those were the two promises. I broke both of them. I became a rabbi instead. <laughs> yeah? And that was a hard, uh, that was a hard curve. <laughs> it wasn't such a simple process. Yes? Uh, but, a lawyer, a psychologist, how many lawyers are in the world? How many good lawyers are in the world? Even bad lawyers. How many bad lawyers are in the world? Sometimes the bad lawyers are the good lawyers. You can't really figure out. When we say a good lawyer, what do you mean? Depends on whose side you are. There was a divorce lawyer here in town, and their ad was, hire me before she does. That was the, like, you don't want to be on the other side of my table. That was the, I was once here at a Lagba Omer event in San Diego, and some guy came over to me and said, oh, I hired that lawyer. There was somebody from the, not our better friend, a better friend. I said, I said, wow, what did they, how did it end? Said, that lawyer, he mopped the floor with my wife. It's terrible. We shouldn't count you for a minyan. A lawyer, for sure not. But probably the lawyer is the chazan or the president or the rabbi. Who, nowadays you don't know anything anymore. That's not the way a person's supposed to behave. A psychologist. There goes like a bad psychologist. But there are a lot of people in the world who can help people with their problems. But how many people can do what you do? The one thing you do, how many people can do it? The way that you do it. You have to stop. What am I doing in this world? Even if you have a job. A job that you find to be pretty mundane. It doesn't matter. What do you do after your job? It hit me something recently. Uh, I was putting on one of these uh, shows for my kids. Wild Kratz. And I was looking at all the... You know how many TV shows are all about work? Do you know what I'm talking about? People work in an office, people work in a law firm, people work in a, uh, in a police station, people who work in a SWAT team, people work... It's all about work. It's a very interesting thing about America. Most people, their work is their whole life. There's like three and a half seconds in every episode where they see their wife, or they go to visit their kids, or they miss the birthday party, or whatever that is. But for the most part, their entire life is work. I think it was Steve Jobs who said, you can either follow your dreams, or somebody else will hire you to follow theirs. There are a lot of people that their whole life is work, but people don't realize, how many hours a day do you work? What's the average working hour of a day? Don't tell me if you work in an emergency room. Average working day. Baruch that works till midnight. Eight hours. Eight hours? Nine hours? How many hours are in a day? 24 hours in it. Waking hours are 12? You're not my wife because you don't sleep 12 hours a night. I can tell you that much. Neither does your baby son. So people work for eight hours, and they sleep for eight hours, and there's nobody here that sleeps for eight hours. So don't fool yourself. What do you do with the other eight hours in your day? Think about it. You eat, you do your laundry, you watch some TV, you read a book. I don't know what you ever do. For eight hours? Eight hours? You could be becoming rabbis eight hours a day. That's a full-time semichat program. You could finish the whole shas. You could memorize the whole Tanakh. You could pray, not with the minyan. I see the people, they run out of the minyan, it's too slow for them. How are you praying for 40 minutes and you can't stay in the room? You have eight hours. And nobody here sleeps eight hours. But if you did sleep eight hours, you still have it. So now you don't sleep, you sleep six hours? So now do the math. You have ten hours? What do you do with those ten hours? Why is it that your career is the only thing that decides what you do in the world? Maybe you do a stupid job. Maybe. But you give tzedakah, you help people who need help, you're there for other people, you go visit old people, yeah, there's a, you, chesed. you go talk to people who don't have any friends. You do things that matter in the world. Maybe those are things that are important. We have to start looking at ourselves more than what people, what are, oh you're a doctor, oh you're an engineer, oh you're a rabbi. I am a rabbi, but not the whole day. And not in 24 hours of the day I'm a rabbi. I would love for my kids to think that I'm a rabbi. You should see the way my kids don't listen to me sometimes. I have the best kids in the world. But sometimes it's my five-year-old kid that looks at me in the face and I just told you to do something. What do you mean don't do something? In that moment, I'm not a rabbi. I'm a dad who's trying to be a dad. Sometimes I'm a husband. Sometimes a better husband, sometimes a worse husband. Sometimes I'm a son. I have parents, Baruch Hashem. I spend some of my day trying to be a good son. There are many things that you do in your life. It's not all just one thing that you do. But are the things that you do in your life valuable enough that you could tell HaKadosh Baruch Hu after 120 years? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I knew what my purpose was and I did it. Can you say that? And if you can't say that yet, that's exactly what you're supposed to be focusing on now. 
not all the imaginations of the Avelot you have to do Teshuvah for, or the, those little Avelot that you're thinking about, those little Avelot really don't matter. They really don't matter. Little, I'm t- little Avelot. You do little stupid things. That's not a big deal. HaKadosh Baruch knows about them already anyways. The Avelot that you need to worry about are the ones you don't even start thinking about yet. The Avera of my life is going nowhere. What about that? I'm asking, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, give me another year of life. It's like when you go to the bank to ask for a business loan. Yeah? And they say, okay, show me your plan for business. Oh, my plan, I didn't think about it yet. Well, so come back when you have a plan. You think I'm going to lend you money, but you don't even know how you're going to pay me back? You go to buy a house. Well, can you show your income? I don't have any income yet. So how do you plan to buy a million and a half dollar house? Well, you're supposed to give me a loan. Yeah, and how are you going to pay back the loan? Listen, they're going to take interest from you. Like, I don't know, they're going to take it, but they, there's a limit to how much interest they can take from you. They also need to know their money is going to come back somehow. You ask the Kadosh Baruch Hu for one more year, but what's your plan? What is your plan that this year is going to be different than last year? And unless you figure out what is Derech HaChaim, the way of life, the next chapter is not even relevant. The next chapter is Derech HaKodesh. Now that I have life, I figured out life. How do I make my life holy? What about people who figured out life, but they fi- haven't figured out that there's more to life than just living? There's something greater in life. There's a Kadosh Baruch in the world. There's a Torah in the world. There are mitzvot in the world. We didn't talk about any of that today. Bezant Hashem, we're going to talk about that next week. For now, we're going to pray Arvit. We'll do a, a bridge to Tonight's Tzlichot are quite short. So Bezant Hashem, please join us for an abridged Tzlichot here in the Berakneza. I'd like to welcome, for those of you who don't know her, Machla, who's visiting us from Toronto. She's been at Shiviti since 2015. And most of the time, she's one of those boxes on the Zoom screen. But those of you on Zoom, let me tell you, it sometimes happens that people pop out of the screen and come in person. It's usually a few hundred dollars later after a plane ticket, but you can pop out of the screen and all of you are invited to join us in person at Kila Chavashamayim. So on behalf of the Kila and everyone at Shiviti, I'd like to welcome you to Kila. Bukhim Abayim.